Trails Collector World, what's shaking? This is Ian bringing you the weekly rundown of the Northeast Trail Running World for the week ending November 5th, 2021. So the flurries are uh, flying out there in some of the uh, higher uh, places outside of Ithaca. I think snow definitely coming down in the uh, mountain regions of the uh, Northeast and New England. Uh, so hopefully at least most of you are excited for the uh, transition and winter still out there hitting some nice uh, fall late fall miles on the trails um, so in this episode uh, as always um, i will bring you a rundown of some of the events that have been going bring you some voices from the trail to cue us in a bit deeper into uh, getting to know some of the uh, trail races uh, in the northeast as well as individuals uh, any fkts if there were some this week uh, mention of gear if there's anything that's kind of caught my attention or come into the store as well as any media pieces that may have caught my eye. Uh, so let's just get into it. Uh, so on the uh, gear front, something I am wearing in today's episode is the Patagonia Airshed uh, Pro Pullover. Uh, this is one that I have uh, mentioned in a prior episode. I think I held it up, commented on the features. I'm gonna comment it on again today just because it's a piece that I have been uh, living in for most of the runs. So our uh, days and temps have dropped to probably I don't know, low 40s, uh, maybe early morning, it's upper 30s, somewhere in there. Um, and for me, what's really critical is a piece that gives me some uh, warmth, uh, insulatory value, does a little bit of uh, wind block, a little bit of uh, water resistance if there's a little bit of rain coming down, uh, but ultimately it still needs to breathe really well. And then features that I'm really after in pieces that I come to love are a really functional hood. Uh, which the airshed has pretty tight gasket comes up pretty high uh, if you need coverage when you're out there uh, for sure around the chin mouth if you need to tuck it in tuck it in uh, it has uh, longer sleeves uh, so that i don't have to go on and off with gloves i can just kind of tuck my hands in but the sleeves are intentionally made longer so you can do that and then it has a i don't know whether you'll be able to see it in the uh, camera here but it's got a two-way zip so also a feature that I'm using a lot where you can bring it up, uh, allow the airflow through uh, your chest uh, if needed, but still keep that uh, warmth up around your uh, neck where you've got the exposed skin. Uh, really light, really comfortable, and I can wear it just throughout the day just for comfort in addition to running. Uh, Patagonia has made some really incredible, incredibly functional gear. Uh, it's not just the brand name where it's the uh, Patagucci uh, higher priced uh, pieces. It really uh, runs and performs really well. So just another mention to this, we do have it in the uh, Finger Lakes Running Company here as well as it should be, I think, online at the our store, which is the Trails Collective uh, site, uh, e-commerce store. So if you're interested, check it out. Uh, we have it in men's at the shop at the moment, mediums, a bunch of mediums, and I think one large at least in. We might have a small uh, the women's also, they make an Airshed uh, Pro uh, pullover hoodie as well. Uh, we haven't been able to get that into the store just yet, uh, but Patagonia does make it, and you can check it out. Uh, something else that came into the store this past week was the long-awaited Solomon Ultra Glide. Uh, this is one that we were supposed to get uh, early, uh, as an early release uh, dealer or partner. Um, I think it was back in like February or April or something to that effect, and it just kept getting delayed and delayed. Uh, finally came in the store a week or so ago, and this is just a max cushion uh, model from Ultra Glide. Uh, really taking a stab at uh, the Speed Goat, which many of you may wear or are familiar with, uh, which really came to kind of mix up or, or redefine a trail category in terms of a max cushion shoe. Uh, putting them on uh, side by side, I haven't run the Ultra Glide yet, and historically I've not been a big fan of the Speed Goat. I just feel like I'm up too high. For those of you who know me, I know my every few years I'll have a uh, pretty severe ankle roll and tear some ligaments and, uh, and whatnot. So I'm just really leery of being up high uh, over that cliff uh, without a lot of ground feel. Um, I'm pretty excited about the Ultra Glide. Uh, first, at least uh, cruising around uh, the store in it out of the box. It uh, definitely has a more slender profile than the Speed Goat. Um, Shoe reviews I haven't done in a while just because I've been coaching this fall and I haven't been on the trails much, so I haven't been able to get in many dedicated trail models to uh, test a uh, trail shoes. Uh, right now I'm in a max model from Innovate. Um, we'll get there in terms of a review. Uh, but in terms of just kicking around side by side, the uh, Ultra Glide from Salmon just feels a little bit lower profile. Uh, but as you know from some of my shoe reviews, for those who have taken, in, uh, taken them in in the past, you know I dig pretty deep. I try to do my due diligence in uh, taking my own measures and weights 
and not just going off of what is uh, posted online on various sites. Because I don't know if it's necessarily comparing apples to apples or they're really actually questioning or testing the metrics that are thrown out. And then I, what I've seen is some of the companies aren't necessarily giving you apples to apples and how they're uh, actually measuring things like stack height. So uh, with the uh, Speed Goat, for instance, you'll find, I think, multiple uh, stack measures. Uh, for me, I just got the digital goniometer here, and so I can take the actual measure. Uh, so when I take at least the heel measure, I come up with 38 millimeters high in the heel. Uh, the Ultra Glide, I'm seeing numbers posted relatively all over the place uh, online. Uh, so I don't know what necessarily people are pulling on. Uh, when I take my own in-house uh, measure of the combined stack from the uh, outsole uh, through to the insole, I'm getting a 34 millimeter uh, stack height, and that uh, is a bit off from what's posted on some of the other uh, sites. So again, until I see what they're using to measure or whether they're just reposting things that they read or whatever, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, the 38 versus the, the 34, and although four millimeters is, it's basically the, the height of one of these Ultra Glide lugs, not a very um, big raw measure, uh, but you definitely feel the difference underfoot. The um, Ultra Glide feels lower profile. The uh, Speed Goat, you feel the distinctive uh, catch, which is somewhat of their dynamic rocker platform. And it's just a really exaggerated toe spring in front of your metatarsals. So you feel the catch about here and the shoe kind of engages on that rolling dynamic uh, from there. Uh, the Ultra Glide just feels more consistent uh, all the way through. Uh, it doesn't feel overly spongy right out of the box, and I think in running that'll be a good thing. Uh, the spongier you make a shoe, the less efficient it becomes, and the less uh, ground feel you have as well. Uh, so what I also noticed out of the box is it has, it seems like a fairly traditional Solomon taper to it. I've not always loved that uh, out of the box, and but it'll take putting some miles in to know whether I'm going to get any rubs or catches here. It feels a little uh, narrower to me uh, than the Wild Cross or the Cross, some of the Cross series, uh, which I've really loved the past couple of years. So I'm a little bummed about that. I would have liked if the last that they used for the Ultra Glide was more similar to what they used for the Wild Cross. I think this really connects with a larger population of U.S. runners uh, versus more of the uh, Euro background. Um, but it'll take some miles to see how that uh, plays out. Um, so we do have some of the Ultra Glides in the store. I think we've got just a, a core size run. I think um, definitely men's. I believe women's came in as well, though I'm not seeing them right around me at the moment. But uh, let us know. They've been really tough to get and really delayed. So once they're gone, I don't know when we can get them next, but they are here now. All right, so <clears throat> on the uh, Ultra Sign Up Hot List, events that will uh, cap out here shortly. The NCR Half and Marathon slated for November 27 in Sparks, Maryland is 91% full with 39 spots available. Um, and that is in our lineup of Trails Collective uh, flat and fast events. Uh, check out the featured article section of the Trails Collective where I've ranked a number of events uh, whether it be from scenic value, state by state, whether it be flat and fast, or whether it be toughest, and then breaking the toughest down per category. Uh, if you haven't yet, uh, check those out. And we have, I think it also, that um, I have some paid um, slots for those articles on Facebook too, so it may be streaming across your feed. If you think they're kind of cool or you find them useful, definitely uh, take the time to like and share. It definitely uh, helps us in getting more exposure out there. Uh, and the Freight Train 50K, 100K running December 11th in Farm for Farmville, Virginia is 98% full and will cap by this weekend. Uh, there were no FKTs reported in this week uh, to the fastest known uh, time site. Uh, but uh, uh, let's see, another piece. In the media, often we'll start with the media. I jumped in with gear this week. Uh, in the media, uh, Culture Episode 161 uh, was out, I think, last week. It was called, called Leaf Catch Assing, with weighing in on the latest gear for leaf catching on the run. Uh, so I don't know about you, uh, but the leaves have definitely been falling around us, uh, so very seasonally appropriate. And then a, um, I think it was a couple episodes old now, uh, Running Times with Gags. Uh, some of you may know uh, Michael Gags Gagliardi out of Philadelphia. Uh, his October 7th episode was titled uh, The Medicine Man, and Gags uh, connected with Brian Wilford. Uh, he's the head medic for Destination Trails and the Triple Crown of 200s. Um, and the consultant for the Cocodona 250. And somewhat retired, he travels cross-country in an RV with his rescue dogs from one big mountain ultra to the next. 
and this episode being and connection being personal for Gags. Uh, Gags refers to him as the best cut man in the business after saving his race at the Tahoe 200. Uh, so we will plug the link in the show notes, uh, but you can uh, check that out if so inclined. All right, so let's get in. We had a handful of uh, results from this past week, and we will bring you a handful of voices as well from the collective. The uh, Topsco Valley 50K in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, it is a beautiful gem uh, resource, which is Patapsco Valley State Park outside of Baltimore. Uh, some beautiful single track, a few stretches which feel pretty remote, if only for a few fleeting moments. Uh, this is one that I did a couple years ago and did a video, which is also on the Trails Collective site. Uh, it doesn't appear that results were live when I was taking my notes, uh, but the White Oak, White Oak crew who puts it on were able to connect me with the overall winner, Patrick Blair of uh, Catonsville, Maryland. Uh, Patrick had finished second last year, or in 2020, in a time of 4.20, uh, a bit under three minutes out of first, so he was definitely in the hunt. And no doubt he was back this year on a mission to go for the win, and that he did. So Patrick, cue us into Patapsco Valley 50K. Hi, my name is Patrick Blair. Raced the uh, Patapsco Valley uh, 50K last weekend. Um, I was able to go uh, walk away with a win. I'm very happy about that. I've been kind of obsessed with this race for the last few years. I've been training for it and training on the course because the course is in my backyard like every weekend, every day. Probably race the course a thousand times in my mind. <laughs> uh, you know, I was, so I was very happy to, to get the win on Sunday. Um, uh, my friend Pat Stem, he was second. Uh, I've been training with him a lot on the weekends. Uh, he recently joined uh, my team, so that's pretty cool. Um, let's see. So, uh, leading into the race, uh, you know, the forecast didn't look good, and the race directors made the good choice of moving the race from Saturday to Sunday because uh, the state park and the people that go and ride and use the state park, nobody likes it when you run on muddy trails or you ride on muddy trails and you mess up the trails that we work so hard to maintain. So, I think it was a really good decision. And on the race day, it ended up that the trails were very dry. So, you know, no harm to the trail system there. And we also had to uh, move the river crossings and cancel those out because the river was just too high. You know, we didn't want anybody, the, the race directors didn't want anybody to get injured. So I think that was a good choice too. They added like a mile and a half extra to an already extremely challenging course. Um, they, they had also changed the course from previous years, uh, which I love the changes because it was a two-loop course now, which is great because then you get your own aid station at the halfway point. And also it added a thousand feet of elevation, at least according to Ride with GPS map data. Uh, so, you know, a more challenging course is always a little more fun. Um, yeah, so uh, going into the race, I knew that, or I was pretty sure that the two uh, guys that I was most worried about were uh, Pat Stem and Daniel Rowe. I had raced Daniel in uh, the Baltimore Marathon, and he was he finished right behind me. And uh, Pat Stem, I'd been training with, like I said, and I knew he was super fast going into the race. Uh, also, my friend John Dennis, I uh, figured he was going to be fast. Uh, and then there's always the chance that there would be somebody that I just didn't know showing up on race day. But those were the guys that I was mostly concerned with, especially Pat Stem. Um, so uh, from the gun, I, I just kind of took the lead through the parking lot and into the trails. I wanted to be in the lead as much as possible because my strategy was to attack with everything that I had on the downhills, hopefully get a gap on everybody, and then make them work to catch back up while I rested, rested on the uphills. And they kind of worked out. Um, yeah, I got a big gap on the first downhill. Uh, Pat and Dan caught back up. And every downhill after that, I would just attack really hard, and uh, they would always catch back up. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, I, they didn't catch back up after about mile eight or thirteen ish, about maybe eight. I think it was eight when I didn't see Dan anymore, and about maybe thirteen or so when uh, Pat and I separated. And then from there, after that, I just tried to continue with that pace. So I just kept attacking the downhills and uh, trying to go as easy as possible in the uphills. Although I did start to let loose a little bit after the halfway point and just kind of go hard as much as possible throughout uh, for the rest of the race. Uh, unfortunately, when I got to the halfway point, I could not find my aid station bag, even though it was in the pile of aid station bags, I just couldn't find it. I should have, usually before a race like this, I mark my aid station bags with like uh, some construction paper that's like yellow or orange or something, something easy to see, but I just didn't do it. 
because uh, I thought I would be setting my own aid station bag down in its place, but it, it turns out uh, they moved the aid station bags to where the aid station was, so it got set into a place that I didn't know where it was going to be. And there were too many bags, and I was just too flustered when I got there because Pat Stem at, the, at that point was still really close, I, I figured. So uh, I, I was just too flustered. I couldn't find it. And so I ran out of the aid station with only new water in my water bottles. Uh, so then I didn't have my goos which was kind of a bummer because my goos have lots of sugar and caffeine that I need or that I like to use for the race. Um, so at the aid stations after that I just asked them for you know any sugar that they had so I ended up getting a lot of Halloween candy. Skittles are surprisingly chewy. I haven't had Skittles since I've been a kid and I just like would I chewed all the Skittles at once and then I ended up with this huge block of stuff in my mouth and I, as much as I chewed it it just wasn't going down. I just wanted the calories so bad. Uh, so that was uh, interesting but got through it and the, the candy was good enough so that I didn't bonk too bad. I feel like at the last mile or so I really started to get a, like, a little bit dizzy and I started to slow down a little bit just in the last mile. Um, and I think if I would have had my goose maybe that wouldn't have happened. Uh, it, it's hard to say. Um, certainly after the race my, my thighs are really beat up right now because of how hard I went on the downhills. Like last year I also raced Patapsco and I got second. Um, to a very fast guy who uh, races in Italy, and uh, actually he got seventh at UTMB. So that was pretty that was pretty cool to have a guy that got seventh at UTMB at our local race. Um, he was not there this year, unfortunately. I've been messaging him. I tried to get him to come, but he couldn't make it. He's still in Italy. He says he's coming back next week to Maryland, so maybe we'll do some training together. But that's um, Stefano Ruza. Um, but yeah, he so he wasn't there, and uh, but. This year, I, I like I said, I went harder on those downhills, and my thighs are really beat up right now. And last year, I feel like I recovered and I felt great the next day. This year, I can't run, and it's two days later. But I guess that's that's okay. That's to be expected. You know, it's a hard race. Um, let's see. Just trying to think of other things that uh, might be interesting for this race. I mean, uh, the race directors, Sean, Ryan, and Mario are just incredible. I'm so happy that they put on this race every year. I can't wait to go back next year. I can't wait till my kids are old enough to run it with me. You know, they were at the finish line, and, uh, you know, they, they run with me every day. We run about one or two miles, and it's going to be really cool one day when I'm like 55 or 60 and they're running this race with me, because I really think that's going to happen one day. Got this cool shirt. All everybody who raced it got a cool shirt. Got this finisher's mug. Everybody who finished got a finisher's mug. I mean, we get so many treats and prizes. It's great. I've got so many of these shirts. It's fantastic. Let's see. When I first fell in love with this race, I'm actually um, through my adult life. I've really been. A, I'm 40, so through my adult life, I've really been a cyclist. I was a cyclist pretty much straight after college. So in college, I was a runner. I ran at UMBC on the track and cross country teams. I was a soccer player before that. And then uh, after college, I got into cycling. So all my friends, we've always been cyclists, you know, ever since college until just recently, a couple years ago, I've tried to, I'm, I've been dabbling back into running a little bit, um, just for a change of pace. It's kind of fun to do something different. Um, I was really competitive in cycling in the, at the local scene, um, and and now I'm kind of switching gears. My, my legs have drastically decreased in size. They used to be big, muscly cyclist thighs, and now they're more skinny you know, not as muscly runner thighs and legs. Um, right, and uh, I got into this, I got into Patapsco 50K and my obsession with it because I was actually the uh, the lead bike, not necessarily the lead bike, but my job a few years ago at Patapsco 50K as a volunteer was to go out and scout the course to make sure the course markers were still up and, and that nobody had moved them around because I guess that had happened one year. And uh, I was out there, you know, scoping out the course, looking at all the markers, and it was a beautiful fall day, and I was like, oh my gosh, I need to race this race. I'm not a runner, but I'm going to be a runner next year, I'm going to race this race. And, uh, and then I did it, and, you know, my goal was to finish, and I did, and then after I finished, I said, wow, I'd like to win this race. You know, if I train, like, a lot, I can probably win it. You know, so I, I run a lot, you know, I, I run a lot, a lot, probably like 15 or 18 hours a week, and uh, most of it's, almost all of it is really slow. I never ever run as fast, almost never run as fast as I did in the race in any of my training runs. I believe that is really important uh, to run super slow because I, it still builds your fitness and it uh, reduces that chance of injury because unlike with cycling, the chance of injury is real in the running world. 
and it is a factor that you must consider. With cycling, you don't have to consider that factor. You can just bike all day. You know, the only thing that's going to happen is you get really tired and you might overtrain, and that that's almost like being injured, but not quite. You're not going to get an overuse injury from biking. It, if you do, it's extremely rare. You're going to crash and fall, but those aren't overuse injuries. You'll heal from a broken bone. Overuse injuries are the kinds of injuries that'll take you out, you know, for good. So, you know, you got to really be careful with that with running. That's why I'm a huge believer, and I tell all my friends, you got to run slow all the time. And uh, when you go fast, you really go fast. But mostly, you should be running really, really slow. So for my training leading up to this race, I was actually a cyclist for most of this year. I only started training and running, like, in September. And, uh, yeah, I just ran really slow. Like, you know, in the race, I ran 8.20-ish per mile. And uh, most of my training runs are 10 to 12 minutes, even sometimes 14 and 15 minute pace runs. You know, I'm running at 14 and 15 minute pace a lot. 12 minute pace probably most of the time. And, uh, but I do run a lot of miles. You know, I run two, mi two hours pretty much every day. I do take off one day a week. I think that's also very important um, to let the body heal and rest one day a week. And then I run two, at least two hours every other day, you know, longer, four or five hours on Saturdays, four or five hours on Sundays. So yeah, I run a lot. I have a family, uh, so I do a lot of my running like at 4 a.m. before anybody wakes up, which really works out well. They barely know that I'm running. They barely, like, you know, it doesn't affect the family life, which is good. Um, yeah, everybody should run slower. Run slower. Nobody runs slow enough. I shouldn't say nobody, but very, very few people. Um, and then when you do run fast, do your really, really hard workouts, but make them short, short and hard workouts, just to teach the body how to clear that lactic acid. Once you teach the body how to clear the lactic acid and you have the endurance and the strength from running a million slow miles, that's all you need to race fast. There's a lot more to it, but that's uh, those are my big things. Yeah, so uh, thanks for this interview. I really appreciate it. Um, I appreciate everybody, all, all the volunteers, you know, I try to say thank you to all the volunteers while I'm out there running, but I think towards the end of the race, I was a little delirious, so I might not have said thank you to everybody, but I, you know, I tried, um, you know, and uh, good job to everybody who finished that course, because it was even harder than it's previously been in all the other years, and the, and the, all the other years it was really hard, so this year was extremely hard, you know, over 4,000 feet of elevation, over 50K because of the extra added miles we had to go around the river. You know, it was, it was really a challenge out there. So anybody that finished that, or even anybody that attempted it, you know, congratulations. And uh, if you didn't finish, there's always next year. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, see you later. All right, another one that uh, went down. Uh, well, there was one that went down under the in New Jersey. Uh, it's under the radar. I won't even use it by name. Uh, it's If you know about it, you know about it. It's a, a race or an event with... Um, a significant amount of elevation gain, really beautiful part of uh, New Jersey, um, but it's one that they uh, try to keep on, on the down low, pretty small field, not a lot of uh, press behind it. Uh, it ran, looks like they had uh, decent conditions, maybe some mud up there, but uh, hopefully everybody had a great day out there. Uh, Horseshoe Bend Boogie, 25K, 50K, 50 mile, went down in Frenchtown, New Jersey. Uh, this is a first year event. Uh, the 25K, 50K, 50 mile ran in conjunction with a horse endurance race. And wins went to Jimmy Bryant in the 25K, Michael Walmelsdorf and Christina Huber, Christine Huber in the 50K, and Michael Schoolbraid and Kimberly Drazda in the 50 mile. And taking us deeper into the Horseshoe Bend is women's 50 mile winner, Kimberly Drazda. Hi, I'm Kim Drozda, and I got to run the first ever Horseshoe Bend Boogie 50 mile race in Frenchtown, New Jersey last weekend. We didn't know what to expect going into this. We were basically trying to get, um, my boyfriend needed a qualifying race of 50 miles or more for an event we're doing next year. And this was the only one that fit our schedules. It was close enough we could drive to. So we didn't know the terrain. We didn't know the elevation. We didn't know about the horses. <laughs> we didn't know anything going into this. We just were like, let's just wing it. Let's just go and get this over with. It was basically our attitude going into it. So the day before they hit, they got hit with massive storms in New Jersey. Um, they actually sent out an email recommending that we get this app because they were afraid a lot of the flagging had come down. So we did. We downloaded the app. There were three specific maps that pertain to this race that you needed. Um, we really didn't need them, though, in the beginning. We get out there. The roads are flooded. Trees are down. We're like, this is going to be a disaster. But it wasn't that bad. Um, the race organizers were so great. They had everything taken care of. They took an extra half hour to actually check the course to make sure everybody was safe. 
So we got started around 6.30, we all gathered in the main road, um, headlamps on, we did a quick little countdown and we were off into the woods. Um, the first seven miles were um, mostly in the, the park trails. Um, they were really well taken care of too. Like there was nothing overgrown. It wasn't that rocky. It was a little bit of hills, not bad though. It was really nice. Given the weather, I mean, it was wet, but it wasn't bad. It was very easily runnable. So seven miles in, we encounter our first aid station. They had everything you could think of. They were so wonderful. I actually had to stop to compliment them because their course marking was so great, even with the storms. Like they had, um, the ribbon was actually in big arrows in some points. I took pictures. I was so impressed. I've never seen a trail or a trail race marked that well. So um, we get through there and then they direct us across the street onto like the rail trail. So we run along the New Jersey River for about nine-ish miles and that's where we count our first horse. Um, it was pretty cool. I've never seen a horse that close up before, nor had I ever run with horses. It, they were so cool though. They were just passed along peacefully. They let you know, the riders let you know they're coming and they just passed by and that was that. It wasn't even like anything weird. I thought it would be, but it wasn't. So about nine miles on the rail trail, we encounter a guy and he directs us back across the street up into some farmland. So we're going up there. We're about 17 ish miles in. Um, it was the next aid station. They had a lot more for the horses there. Um, the vet check they had, um, actually like, hay, <laughs> like someone had like bowls with like their names on it. It was cute. Um, they had buckets of water at the aid stations for the horses too. Uh, it was interesting to say the least. But um, so we come back through there and then head back up on the rail trail to go back towards Horseshoe Bend Park. Um, those miles just take forever for me. I'm not a big fan of rail trails, but I mean, it was beautiful with the, the fall scenery, the leaves, the river. It was just, it was so gorgeous. I didn't even mind the flat ground that much. So we get back up to where Horseshoe Bend Park is. We could get that to that first aid station that we ran into and they kind of give us directions where to go. We had the app if we needed, we really didn't need it though. So we're going through the park and at this point, the horses had been through the wet ground and it was just so muddy. It was a mess. Like you couldn't even run at some points because your foot would just get suctioned into the mud. So we were just kind of basically power walking this whole section of the course. Um, it was what it was though. It was still a nice day out. We were having fun, you know, laughing, talking, whatever. We were having a good time. So we get back to the original point where you check in, where the start line was, and that was where we had to start our, our last, it was a 13.3 mile loop. They had some hot food there for us, um, clean up a little bit. We had our drop bags there. We even bothered changing shoes. We we're like, what's the point at this point? And that's where we found out that the course was actually getting so dangerous for the horses that they rerouted them, which I mean, was super considerate of them, but we were still continuing on the main muddy course. So uh, we knew this time we had to look for a different color flagging. I had the map ready just in case I needed it. Um, so we're trekking along and I mean, it wasn't bad, bad. It wasn't pleasant either, but um, at this point, point in the game I mean horses are running where you're running so there's a lot of poop mixed in with the mud so that was um different but on a good note my feet have never been softer so there might be something to that <laughs> you never know but um we get through and it's um starting to get dark we were basically just trying to get him finished before the cutoff without trashing my legs because I have a road marathon this weekend so it was a little balance of both so we were taking our time and just kind of enjoying the scenery as muddy as it was we were just dealing with it um, we come to the last aid station or what we thought was the last aid station anyways. And, um, they're just so friendly. We actually sat down for a little bit, talked with them. We got something to eat. Um, I found a horse clover. That was kind of cool. <laughs> and then, um, we continued on our way. At this point, we did start needing to use the map because it was like a little bit intersecting and it was so easy that like you pull up the map and it was just like using GPS in your car and it had arrows in which direction you go to. And then you can actually see yourself on the map. So as we were like running, we could see where which direction we're moving to. So if we made like a, a wrong turn at any point in time, the map would just show us. It was the most high tech race I've ever been in, especially when it comes to like trail racing. Um, got off the muddy parts for a little bit, went up through this little um, like farmland. It was pretty nice up there. At that point, it's starting to get dark. So we were kind of like, okay, like let's, let's get this over with now. We were just, we've had enough. So about two miles left to go. We're heading back down um, again, farmland. We got a little bit off course, could not figure out where to go because we couldn't really see it. At that point, it really wasn't as well marked. So again, thank God for the map. Um, we did find our way back to the main road and a little bit of bonus mileage in there. That's all right though. And then um, we started seeing signs and they had glow sticks hanging for us, which is like, I don't know, just super heartwarming <laughs> at that point in the game when you're cold and it's dark. But we saw these little green glow sticks hanging from the trees. We're like, we're getting close. So uh, we, were, we were hightailing it back towards, you could see lights off in the distance and we knew that was where the barn was. So we like, hightailed it at that point. We were just jogging along. 
Um, it was probably our fastest mile and a half of the whole race, honestly. But we get to the end, turns out we finished second and third. Uh, we finished high-fiving at the finish line, but um, he had told him to put my name first. I wasn't really first though. Um, and that was it. It was really nice. So we got to sit down for a little bit. They gave us um, all kinds of goodies, warm food, drinks. I mean, you name it, they had it there. They are so sweet. They sat down, talked to us about the course. Um, we got to hose off, which is always a luxury of a trail race. Overall, it was a wonderful experience, even despite the terrible weather and the mud. It was really, really nice. Um, I'd highly recommend it for anybody looking to get into ultras if you've never done that distance before. Because, I mean, the terrain wasn't bad at all. And um, it was relatively flat in terms of trail racing. So I highly, highly recommend if someone maybe is a little bit afraid to try a bigger race. It's, it's a great starter 50K or 50 miler. Also, the horses were kind of cool, too. Um, that's all I got. The Summit 50K 50 Mile uh, ran in Salamanca, New York, another inaugural event. Uh, this was put on by Ian uh, and his entity Reluctant Runner Racing, Ian Nelson. Uh, and it was run in Allegheny State Park. Uh, for those of you who don't know Allegheny, really a uh, beautiful part of uh, Pennsylvania into New York. Uh, just really rolling hills, um, some old mountains, and some uh, beautiful trails for uh, running, riding, hiking, what have you. Uh, in this inaugural event, 25K wins went to Alexander Rossbach and Jessica Weinman. Uh, Kyle Dick and Margaret Frank in the 50K. Looked like there was a really tight finish there for the women's 50K win, uh, with Margaret edging out second place finisher Hannah Gardy by 18 seconds. Uh, Margaret, is a, Margaret is a friend from here in Ithaca, uh, so I'll have to catch up with her on that win, and great job. And then 50 mile, James Pergolesi and Jenna uh, Pickwitz for the men's and women's wins in 8.56 and 11.08. So giving us a deeper view into the inaugural Summit 50K 50 Mile is the uh, creator and RD, uh, Ian Nelson. Take us in. Hey Ian, thanks for uh, having me on Trails Collective. Uh, my name is Ian Nelson. I am the owner uh, of uh, Reluctant Runner Racing and um, <clears throat> the race director for the Summit 5050. Uh, I also spell my name correctly, unlike uh, Ian Golden who is missing an I in his name. Uh, so uh, that's a little side note, but um, so the Summit 5050 is um, a race that I came up with at uh, Allegheny State Park, consists of a 50 mile, 50K and 25K uh, distances. The course uh, originally was supposed to be a uh, 17 and a half mile loop with roughly 2,400 feet of gain, uh, but due to the uh, little known and rare uh, blunt-nosed fern, I had to reroute the course uh, to stay off of one of the trails um, uh, in the park. So the course ended up being a 15 and a half mile loop with uh, a short out and back uh, for the 50 mile runners so they could get to their uh, number. Uh, the trails, uh, at um, the Art Roscoe Cross Country Ski Center, Ski and Mountain Bike Center, um, are primarily double track, but the course that I was able to lay out is um, has about three to four miles of single track, um, and um, for the most part is, is rolling hills, except for the start, the first five miles or so. Um, from the start line, it, it, you descend about 800 feet uh, over the course of about three miles and then over the next two miles you gain that 800 feet back so there's a pretty big climb right when you get to the bottom you start going back up uh, and then you regain that that descent in about two miles um, after that the course is completely rolling there's very little uh, if any um, flat area of the course so uh, it really takes a toll on your legs um, over the course of that distance whether it's a 25k uh, 50k or the 50 mile um, distance so um, if I back up a little bit the I found the course well I found the park and uh, am a little bit impulsive and maybe too ambitious for my own uh, for my own good. So I actually proposed a hundred mile race at the park. 
uh, and the park is big enough to handle it. Um, but it might have been a little bit too much since they're they're not all that accustomed to having races there, uh, and, and not ultra marathons. They have some events, but uh, not ultra marathon distances. So uh, that uh, hundred mile proposal quickly was was rejected. Uh, so I changed courses, and um, you know. I, re I really wanted to have a race this year, uh, and I wanted to do it there because I knew it was going to be beautiful with the leaves changing, uh, and uh, wanted to do a fall race uh, there to really highlight uh, the beauty of, of the southern tier and um, upstate New York in general. So uh, I came up with the Summit 5050, and uh, then later added the 25K, um, which I'm glad I did. Um, so Allegheny State Park, it's New York's largest state park, um, has a great multi-purpose trail system and uh, is really, like I said, a beautiful setting um, for a race or uh, a hike. Equestrian, it has a little bit of everything, snowmobile, power line trails, um, really a little bit of everything. It's got a couple lakes, do some swimming, and um, it's really a gorgeous park, it really is beautiful. Um, so race day started out with a little bit of a drizzle at uh, 6 a.m. start, but that quickly kind of went away and uh, then was cloudy and in the 50s all day um, and really made for a perfect, perfect running day. So um, across the three races, I'd say we had uh, just shy of 30 runners and a few more than 30 register. Uh, and then some had to uh, had to change of plans uh, and had to back out. But um, of course, I wanted more. Uh, but again, being ambitious and impulsive, uh, I wanted more. But um, 30 was a great number, and I was happy to be there uh, because it it allowed me to do a couple of things. One it was more manageable for me for being a first time race director. Um, but uh, it also allowed me to be a little bit more personal with uh, with the runners, and um, to really kind of feel the same excitement uh, and emotion that they had uh, completing their their races. So uh, it was great. It was a lot of fun, and um, I had, I had a great time, and uh, I think everybody else did as well. A couple of highlights I'd say from from the race. I think. For me, um, it was meeting runners from, from all over, and I was kind of surprised at, at the, um, the distances that we, that we had uh, for runners. So part of the reasoning for putting the race there was to draw people not only from upstate New York, um, but also uh, you know, from Cleveland, from Pennsylvania, uh, even from New Jersey. Uh, it's pretty centrally located and is a couple hours from uh, Buffalo, from Rochester. Cleveland isn't too far. Um, Ithaca is, is not uh, not too bad from Ithaca and uh, even down Pennsylvania. So um, it was great. I was really excited and thrilled to, to see all of that, um, uh, all those people from all over. And I hope to hope to grow it you know, in the future, I'd like to get some more people from from New England and, and from maybe down the mid states, um, even Virginia and uh, Ohio and uh, maybe Michigan and, and so on and beyond. So, um, I think for the runners, the the highlight for the runners was really having a beautiful day and a beautiful setting in a new park that a lot of people had discovered. Uh, that was probably the most frequent comment or question was, how'd you find the park? Or, um, wow, I didn't even know this, this park existed uh, and was here. And the trails are, it's a great place if you're doing some training and want, want to mix it up and, and do something different. It's got hills, it's got elevation, it's got some technical stuff. It's got um, some easier double track. Uh, and groomed and, and they're well well care, cared for and, and taken care of so um, yeah it was it was a great weekend overall it was a lot of work to, to get to that point um, uh, but I could not have been happier with 
the outcome. Uh, and it was a lot of fun and uh, I look forward to, to doing it again. So uh, yeah, that's the Summit 5050. And uh, hopefully we'll see you out there next year and uh, I'll certainly be rooting everybody along uh, along the way. So thanks very much. Have a great uh, November. Have a great week. And uh, we'll see you later. All right. Cheers. The Castle to River Run 5K and half went down. They've had a, traditionally some longer events, including a 50K in prior years, uh, was the Castle to River Run in uh, Garrison. And Castle River uses a beautiful uh, network of uh, pretty runnable trails on the Hudson Riverside Flats and Hudson Highland uh, State Park. A uh, good piece of history. The course follows part of Benedict Arnold's escape route and it's just across the uh, river from West Point. Uh, it was also able to return to a passing of the namesake Osborne Castle, uh, which sits pretty cool like uh, up on the hill overlooking the Hudson River. Uh, 5K wins went to Eric O and Katie Gully, and in half to Simon Lee and Kirby Mosenthal, uh, with 138 and 141 for Simon and Kirby. Uh, I've known Simon since he was a kid. Uh, both he and his dad both uh, ran and raced. It's good to see Simon getting the better of his, uh, his old man pops at this point. I think his dad Brian's going to turn 50, I believe, next year. So we're trying to plan some sort of a uh, cool event. And there was a bit of navigational hiccuping during the event, so distances and times were a bit relative this year. Um, but we did get clips in from both Simon and Kirby. Uh, so both of you take us a little bit deeper into Castle to River. Hey, uh, Simon Lee here doing a quick recap on Castle to River half. Ended up being a little bit longer than a half for me and a little bit under for, I think, most everyone else. Um, weather on the day was pretty sweet, 50 or so with a bit of rain midway through. Started about nine. First half mile, group just totally split. Me and a couple other guys took the chute down into the hill. There were like some arrows painted onto the, the path that we were on that I think ended up ultimately not being for the race in, that we were running. Um, bottom of the hill, there's a, there's a Y. I took a left, a bunch of other people took a right. Me and a couple other guys who took a left see the big group of 50 or so people above us not going down the hill. Figure that's right and sort of book it back up the hill. Uh, but at this point, 10, maybe 15 people had, had taken a right, uh, at the bottom of the hill. And we do this little grass loop and come back and I think it ultimately ended up maybe being an extra half mile going around that grass loop and not going down the hill. I don't ultimately know what happened to that first group that took the right. Uh, I don't know if they got corrected back on the course or just ended up missing that half mile. Um, came around like real close to the river, like pretty awesome scenery. You look out uh, and can see clear across. Um, there was a little mishap with a volunteer at one turn that I'll get to chronologically, but everyone got sent to take this right, essentially. Take a right, sort of come around. I'm a little bit frustrated at this point because I don't know where that group of 10 or 15 people's at, and I figure they have a few minutes into me if they've missed a half mile. Caught most of them just sort of in that first little wooded section and I caught up to Kirby and a couple of other guys at the bottom of the first climb which ended up being three or maybe four miles in just as you're crossing 9D. Started up that big climb right after the field section and was really enjoying a lot of the course. Um, I, I'm in New Paltz now and the carriage roads here are pretty similar so kind of felt like familiar terrain. Um, got, got up to that first climb and, and the course was marked super well aside from that, that first little confusing section of dipping into the woods or not dipping into the woods. Um, was definitely hiking a lot of the hills. I think the hills were, were probably runnable if you wanted to, but I've never been a real advocate of running uphill. So I was definitely crushing some power walking. Uh, cruise, cruise the downhills course was all pretty runnable. There were a couple trees down, just little stuff, uh, but all flagged and stuff. So didn't feel like I, 
I was putting my eyes in danger at all. Um, got to the first aid station, which was a mile five or so, just after you cross the road again and go up this climb. Um, I, I figured at this point that something was a little bit off because the, the map that had been released the day before uh, said that the aid station was going to be five and a half or so in and I wasn't quite at five so I didn't know if it was watch error at that point or course error. You do a big loop around like another climb and come back down past that same aid station and it was supposed to be eight and a half or so and I wasn't even at eight then so again I kind of figured the same thing course error or GPS error. So I come bombing down this hill and the second climb or third climb at this point is back up to the castle and you, you go around the castle which is a pretty cool loop they had a uh, volunteer there sending people the right way and everything was flagged super well i come i come back down like close to the river at this point and you hop back on to uh the course that you've been on after you cross the road one more time and at this point i kind of knew that something was a little bit off because i wasn't going to hit 13 um, at, at the rate we were going and I realized how much of the course was left before we came back by the finish. So I finished the course, popped popped out onto the finish, like just following the flag, which again, like course was real, real well marked at that point. Um, and I came out and I kind of looked down at my watch before going through the finish shoot and I saw I was at 12.1 or 12.2, I think, which I didn't take to be a super big error because the, the course map as it had been sent out was only 12.7 or so. And uh, Ben mentioned that it was hand drawn, so there could be a little bit of error there and to expect the real course to be closer to 13.1, but it didn't end up being so. But I, I come through and I look at my watch and, and a volunteer there was like, you missed a you missed a turn that you were supposed to take. You have to go and do the back half of this loop, or you were supposed to go and do the back half of this loop. And I'm tunnel vision at this point. And I'm about ready to be done, and I just like okay, like I came here to run a half marathon, so I'm gonna run a half marathon. And I hopped back out onto the course and following the flags at this point. Um, end up on a part of the course that was a course. Obviously, there were flags and signs. But but it was unfamiliar to me. I had not been on that part of the course yet. Um, and it came across the railroad tracks which, and did a super cool loop, actually. I was kind of sad to have missed it the first time around. Um, but I come back, I, I run a mile, and I'm like, okay, I hit 13.1. I'm about done running for today. So I turned back around and just jogged back into the finish. Get to the finish, and at this point, there's three or four people there that have just finished, and the volunteer who sent me off the first time was apologizing profusely and she was like you're you were first like you were the first person here oh, we're sorry we didn't mean to send you back out um just ended up being like a little miscommunication basically and ben explained to me that a volunteer at mile two or so was supposed to send us on this little loop that would have added a mile or so which i ended up on at the end um, that would have got everyone closer to 13.1, but fortunately sent everyone the wrong way. So it was at least an even playing field. And I got a little uh, sneak preview of the course for next year, maybe that everyone else missed out on. Um, but overall, a super fun day over across the river. And uh, again, course was marked super awesome. Ben mentioned there was an issue with flagging, people pulling stuff up after he'd flagged, but he went back through and I really don't think any of the course marking was lacking at all. It was just that one human error of the volunteer, which we all know are sort of want to happen when you rely on people, but that's the beauty of it. So yeah, I had a good day overall, felt pretty strong. Course was awesome and real runnable. I didn't personally run all of it, but that's uh, all personal strategy. So Definitely a good race, uh, and I look forward to trying it out again next year. Maybe running, hopefully a little shorter for me, but maybe a little longer for everybody else. Thanks, guys. Hey, everyone. I'm Kirby, and this past weekend I ran the Castle to River Half Marathon. Uh, the race is in the Hudson Highlands in Garrison. I had actually never been on this part of the Hudson Highlands um, trail system before, so it was a really neat opportunity to check out a new part of some local trails. 
the race ended up being a little bit shorter than a half marathon due to um, some misdirection on the race. The entire field of runners ended up going about a mile short, which I don't think anyone had any complaints about. But the, the race was really unique. It's mostly runnable trails. There's also some single track sections and some um, runnable carriage trails as well. The majority of the trails are on public property, but what's really unique about this race is um, there's a section that actually is on private property. And the private property goes around uh, the Osborne Castle. It's actually a historic site. It's also known as Castle Rock, um, but there's a legitimate castle. And the only day of the year that anyone can see the castle um, is during this race, when there is special permission to actually run around the grounds of the castle, which um, was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, lots of... Um, vert i guess in terms of just steep hills and climbing but again all runnable so it's a fast course the even with the mile um, that was cut out of the race uh, you could just tell that the times were still pretty fast the weather was a little bit cold and a little bit rainy but that was actually perfect race conditions to keep it nice and cool the end of the race actually um, a lot of credit to the winner who uh, didn't like the short course and ended up doing extra mileage um, very impressive and actually his father was in the race as well got to talk to them afterwards some Ithaca natives so um, shout out to the Lees they were awesome um, but yeah Ben did a great job too the race director so thank you to him the volunteers at the aid station were, were great you hit up the aid station twice on the way out and the way back they were super energetic, had all the fuel we needed. I passed on one of the booze shots, but I think some people did partake in that, which was just another fun element for some of the runners. Um, but I'm really glad I checked out this race uh, right in a local spot, and I would highly recommend it for anyone who wants something different, unique, check out a historical site. Um, it was a lot of fun. And on the navigational front, that's just stressful. I reached out to my good friend, uh, Ben, uh, we co-direct uh, Breakneck Point together. I know Ben's done and, and his crew and volunteers have done an incredible job marking Castle River in prior years and they've done a phenomenal job with uh, Breakneck the past couple of years. Uh, but hiccups still happen. And, you know, it's, it's really stressful as an uh, RD when it happens. You feel terrible, feel pretty personally responsible. Uh, but all you can do is just kind of respond in the moment and just be, I don't know, hopeful that uh, we as trail runners, we just kind of get that it's Unfortunately, part of trail running, uh, missing turns happens, uh, volunteer hiccups in terms of uh, uh, whether, you know, they make mistakes out there, it just happens. And we just hope we as a uh, collective, even if we're in the hunt for the win as Simon uh, was and, and still did, uh, that we can kind of flex and just uh, take it for what it is and just enjoy the time out there. Uh, so, but hopefully it was a beautiful day and thanks uh, to both uh, Simon and uh, Kirby for, the, uh, for weighing in. Dire Wolf is one that went down uh, last week, or two weeks ago, two weekends ago now. It's a 10 mile run by and supporting the Octorera uh, cross country team uh, booster in PA. Uh, it's a solid mix of hills, rocks, roots, and rugged descending and a creek crossing in the mix. Uh, this year was their seventh annual, it saw a solid turnout. Um, and taking us deeper into Dire Wolf is winner Derek Schultz. My name is Derek Schultz. I ran the Dire Wolf 10 mile trail race this past Saturday, October 23rd in Ackland, Pennsylvania. Uh, I love this race for a few reasons. The fall colors are on point in Southern Chester County. Uh, brilliant reds and, and nice golden yellows. Uh, I also like the varied terrain, everything from some grass fields to uh, some single track, downhill rocks and roots. Uh, just a rolling course with uh, a, a good climb towards the end and uh, a little something for everyone in this course. Um, course has been going on since 2014 and the first few years were a five mile race and then switched to a 10 mile format and uh, it should be switching to a 10 mile and a five mile next year in 2022. Um, it's great that this race uh, proceeds go back to the Octorera Junior and Senior cross country and track and field teams. So going back to the youth running 
and they are the ones at aid stations and helping guide and hand out water and some food. <clears throat> but the race itself starts in a nice field. Um, crisp temperatures early in the morning, field's a little wet, has that cross country feel. You run down the fence line for a bit and then downhill. And that first uh, about half mile kind of helps open up the pack, makes you settle in, find out what your pace is before you enter into the woods and start going on to some rocks and roots. Um, the first two miles are also your last two miles, so you know exactly what you're in for on your way back. Uh, but after uh, about mile three and a half, we enter into this uh, lollipop field section, halfway up a climb, so it kind of gives you a break from this one hill. And in that lollipop field, it's a uh, downhill at first and then down uh, by a creek and then you hit an uphill on the backside to, before you come back out. But during that time, I uh, tried to keep my eye out to see if, how far ahead I was from the second place. And I, I didn't see anybody until I exited. And I don't know if, uh, if that person was in second or in third, if I'd missed somebody. And I, I believe that was Nathan that came into that one. Uh, he was coming into the lollipop as I was leaving. And right then and there, I, I realized I, I had a good couple minute gap if he was in second place. And that gave me more motivation to push up the remainder of the hill, knowing that uh, he had quite a ways to go before he got to where I was and then still had some climbing to do. So I pushed up the hill a bit and uh, get up to the fence line area. And, you know, still had uh, nobody that I could see behind me. And, excuse me, the fence line, as you, you leave that aid station, uh, you duck back into the woods. And this is where uh, we had a little bit of mishap, a little uh, marking mishap. It's around mile six, six and a half, maybe. Uh, and took, to, took down to inside the trail. And where typically in the previous year we turned left, uh, trail markings had us go straight and ran down to uh, an aid station and they said that we were coming in the wrong way. So I quickly doubled back and, and went back up the hill to that intersection where I thought was where the mistake was made and I got caught by all the guys that uh, were chasing me and real quickly uh, gave more motivation to almost restart the race to uh, you know, all my two minute gap or whatever it was had is gone. And now it's, it's all over, you know, it's time to start the race fresh and it was on again. So I, I, as we pushed and we made our way uh, for the remainder of the field before we ducked back into the woods and head down the single track to that aid station again, uh, just trying to put on as much distance as I could between guys behind me since they had uh, caught up so quickly. Um, and it was, it was motivation to, to push forward. And as soon as I got to that two mile stretch, knowing exactly what I had in front of me, um, which is my favorite section because it has the most amount of rocks and roots uh, and single track. And then you have that one nice climb towards the end. Um, I knew if I could make it up that, that final rock climb that, uh, if, I, if there was nobody directly behind me, I'd have enough juice to, to kick it up to, through the field. And uh, sure enough, I, I got up through the field and checked my shoulder and, and I didn't see anybody. And uh, as soon as I came across the finish line, um, I looked and uh, Paul eventually finished in second place uh, about a minute and a half behind me, which um, felt good that I actually was able to put back on some time and distance between uh, me in second place. So it was a it was a fun day, beautiful temperatures, um, great course, uh, really enjoyed the uh, the terrain uh, on the fall day. It's a, it's a great, great way to spend the morning. Um, and I look forward to doing this next year. I look forward to having a five mile and a 10 mile option, hopefully uh, bring out some more people and help benefit the cross country teams. Um, but it is, a, it is a good fall yearly event to go out to. So thank you.
And then two that went down on Halloween, October 31st. Uh, one was the Tussie Mountain Back 50 Mile in Bullsburg, PA, uh, towing the line between road and trail with a uh, really uh, quite hilly uh, gravel terrain. Uh, Tussie is a regional event with some history, uh, being the USATF Road 50 Mile Champs at least a couple of years. Uh, it has a pretty fast track record uh, with women's course records of 624 set by Cassie Scallon and uh, Matt Flaherty for the men's in 528. Uh, both just flying 50 mile events. Uh, both were set in 2013, one of the championship years. And uh, Cassie and Matt are both uh, friends of mine from uh, for a while, I guess now, uh, through running. And both were just uh, on the top of their uh, game, so to speak, those years. And they're just fast. Uh, this year's overall men's and women's wins went to Charles uh, Marlard. Uh, I may have uh, spelled that wrong. In a speedy 620 with Michaela Ingalls fifth overall. Uh, on top for women in 722. Um, it's possible that Michaela will get a clip in in time. Uh, I didn't see Tussie Mountain. Well, I don't think Tussie Mountain backs results were posted, I think, until yesterday. So it was tough for me to reach out to any winners. But uh, I did check in with Michaela as soon as I saw it. If she gets in a clip, we will weave it in now. And in the Virginia Spartan Trail 50K, went down in Arrington, Virginia. Had a number of distances. Uh, 10K, uh, Brent. Brent Trail and Jordan Hoslauden took their respective men's and women's wins over a field of 86. And the half Robert uh, Matrunzik and Emily Jamis Jamison and a, uh, took the win in over a field of 54. And in 50K, Sean Simmons took the overall win in 534, with the top woman on the day being fourth overall, Kayla Perry in 635. And to be seen on the Growth of Spartan Trail, uh, they came out of the gates hard, at least with getting some of the press. So we all know they are a huge corporate entity. And um, to be seen on their cross between uh, OCR and trail. I'm not sure the configuration of the weekend, but I believe they were typical Spartan OCR distances running as part of the larger event. Uh, their media, or at least their website, uh, touted that uh, thousands of Spartan racers uh, were going to be racing this past weekend. Uh, the running or trail portion was a bit under 200. Uh, so I don't know whether there was the uh, a large field of OCR athletes as well. Um, but it's definitely not uh, thousands uh, of trail runners. Uh, so a little mixed, I think, um, marketing there. Um, but I don't know, what do you all think of Spartan? Uh, big entity, uh, whether, uh, whether it's gonna find the same level of success that it's found in OCR, uh, how it feels to have a large corporate entity, whether any of you really care um, whatsoever, uh, whether that's the case, whether you've had really good experiences with Spartan and all for it. Uh, for those of you who may have participated, how was it? How was the course? How was the atmosphere? and the uh, production value. Um, let me know, or weigh in. All right, so uh, that's what ran. There were some voices from this past weekend. Uh, events this coming weekend in the Northeast Trail Running World in Connecticut, we've got eight hours at the farm. In Brookfield, in Massachusetts, we've got a classic Stone Cat 50K in Ipswich. In Maryland, we've got a few. We've got the Bobcat, Bobcat Trail Run 11 Mile in Thurmont, the uh, BRRC Night Moves Trail Race 6 Mile in Baltimore, and the Fire on the Mountain 50K in Little Orleans. In New Hampshire, we have the Blackout 5K 10K in Jackson and the Hamster Wheel 6-hour through 30-hour running in the Hillsborough County Fairgrounds in New Boston. Um, they're going with a solid field, a bit under 300 entrants strong, uh, with the largest singular field being in the 30-hour, where it looks like it should be a pretty solid battle for the women's win. Um, pretty highly ranked, at least from ultra sign-up rankings, uh, women there. So hopefully that's uh, fun. And the uh, White Lakes Ultras, 12 and 24 hour running in Tamworth. In New Jersey, the Batona Trail Race, the 33, 55 mile in Ong's Hat. New York, the Fall Back into Trails, 10K, 50K in LaGrangeville. The Moreau Half in Gainesport. In PA, we've got the Pennypack Trail Fest, 20K, 40K, 60K in Philly. Virginia, we've got the Cross County Trail Marathon and Half in Springfield. The Gritty Leaks Trail Marathons in Goochland. Midnight Maniac, 13 hour endurance run in Williamsburg. And the Mountain Mascus Trail Run in Lynchburg, another classic there. In Vermont, Vermont, we've got the Rupp Fest Running Festival in Williston. And in West Virginia, last on the list, we've got the Rim to River, beautiful 100 in the New River Gorge uh, there in West Virginia. Uh, so that's what's coming at you this weekend on the Northeast uh, Trail Circuit. And uh, I will touch base with you around this time next week for next round. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks for supporting the channel. Thanks for sharing and liking the videos. And I will catch you next week. See ya!